It's a pleasure to be over here, particularly in the Glenn Institute. I had John Glenn's one of my childhood heroes, and in fact, just had a, a meeting with him yesterday. And so um, he's just one of the great people, and having this institute on campus in his name uh, really hits the mark on, on so many things that are important because, you know, we do a lot of great science here. But what I am finding now as I have gone from that young optimistic lab guy doing research with cells to cure cancer, um, implementation or policy in the end is often the biggest hurdle. It's not generating the science. So um, whatever years I have left, a lot of this is going to be devoted to this, this implementation phase uh, that I think it right now is greatly uh, challenging. I'll just leave it at that. So for all of you who are in that domain or interested in it, uh, this is uh, a place where you can really have a lot of impact. Now, not having taught to undergrads in 30 years, uh, this is an interesting new uh, experience for me because I've been teaching medical students, interns, residents, fellows, etc., graduate courses, advanced graduate courses. So this will be fun, and hopefully when I get done next year, I'll be asked back instead of... Uh, blowing this in a big way. And whenever you're teaching in medicine, particularly advanced medical students and interns and residents, the Socratic teaching method is often very much in use, which means you're standing around in the hallway outside the patient's door and you are teaching through asking questions. So please do not feel intimidated if I'm asking you questions today. It's so that we can have a discussion, okay? Um, but that may play out as we go through this. Now, the other thing that I want to do in my old age is not to follow directions. And as Neil asked me to talk about Dietary Guidelines for America, and I started putting this together, I kept seeing other little things that through my experience in food, nutrition, and policy, I thought I wanted to add in. So we're going to hit a couple other topics as we go through this. And when I saw that we had two hours and 20 minutes, man, I, <laughs> we're going to fill this. But the last 30 minutes, I can assure you, is going to be very entertaining because it's actually a video of something on TV I want you to see that is astoundingly entertaining but also astoundingly accurate about uh, a topic that I'm uh, very, very uh, concerned about. So let's get, get rolling here. Um, conflicts of interest, these slides have to be in all of my talks. I don't have any corporate sponsors. I have lots of opinions, and I have research support from many different organizations. But um, thankfully, you do not have to worry that I'm being paid uh, with regards to any of these opinions. Now. So the organization of this, or lack thereof, is going to focus on these issues. There are certain things about background and definitions that you need to have a grasp of. You have to understand. Then a little bit we're going to talk about deficiency syndromes and U.S. policy, or the dietary reference intakes that, to a large degree, solved these problems. And I think it's a great example and libertarians won't like this, of where government rules, regulation, and interference have enormous impact on health. We'll talk a little bit about the diet and cancer just to give you a little flavor of global policy through the AICR and WCRF. We'll talk about that. And then we'll talk about the Healthy American Diet, Dietary Guidelines for America. And then at the end, we're going to talk a little bit briefly about dietary supplements. Now, diet, nutrition, health outcomes, scientific approach. Let me ask, how many people, what are, you, what are your majors? Let's just go around the room. What's your major? Great. So, there's one nutrition major. They kind of get this. 
Nutrition is one of the coolest sciences. Why? It is cool because it transcends all levels of biological organization. It's not like chemistry where it's chemicals or biochemistry, which is biologic metabolism of compounds. Nutrition can be studied at the chemical level, the molecular level, the cells, lab animals, human epidemiology, community research, government policy, etc. It's a cool discipline because you go up and down. It's vertical, not horizontal. So if you can cope intellectually with that kind of diversity, it's a blast, okay? Because what you're doing in the lab can relate to things that are meaningful to health, and they may even relate to things that are meaningful to policy. So it's fun and it's interesting, stimulating, always something controversial going on. So on campus, you'll find people doing all kinds of biochemistry, molecular cell, agricultural research, human clinical research. Some of our folks in public health do community research. And then there is this whole level up here that relates to policy and regulations, um, that governments can do standards of medical care. Medical organizations have the responsibility to define nutritional interventions in clinical situations. For example, if you're a cancer patient with a cancer of your tonsillar pillar and you surgically resect it, go through six rounds of chemo and radiation, one thing you cannot do very well is eat, okay? These people lose 40, 50 pounds if you do not nutritionally care for them, which often means that there are very specific guidelines of putting in a gastronomy tube where you feed them for three or four months to get through this. Because if you don't feed them, the treatment doesn't work as well, you can't get your chemo on time, the side effects are more. You cannot cure without the supportive care. So the medical organizations define how you should nutritionally care for those people. Public health organizations through dietary guidelines, et cetera, affect public health. And there is this whole expanding realm of, it's a discipline unto itself of how do you review the scientific data. It used to be you would just sit in your office, you go to the library, pull a bunch of papers you could find, read the references, get those papers, and try to summarize it. Then with PubMed, you could search keywords, get a whole list, find the papers. You didn't have to get as much exercise, and you would summarize it, but it was your opinion. And people could read the same papers and have different opinions, okay? We're getting a little bit away from that to a degree by doing systematic reviews. The people at the National Library of Medicine are phenomenal at doing this and help the Dietary Guidelines Committee. You define standards of excellence, let's say, for a quality publication, the size of the study, the statistical analysis and power, the duration of the study, is the in, it, where, was the compliance good, was the reporting accurate. You review all the literature first for quality, throw out the bad ones, and then you only review the good ones, okay? This is a science in and of itself and one that's phenomenally helpful, should be helpful in all disciplines that relate to public policy. So enough on this. Define nutrition and diet. So somebody that's not in the nutrition program, tell me what is a nutrient and what is your diet? You're frowning, so start here. A nutrient is something that moves your cells to keep your energy going. What do you think? What's a nutrient? It's a chemical compound that has some function in cellular biology. Uh huh. Anyone else want to add to it? We're refining this a little as we go around the room. 
nutrient. Just like a, some kind of chemical or some sort of thing that helps fuel cells and energize them. Interesting. Okay, go to the back. So that's related to nutrition, but nutrient. Let's stick to the word nutrient. What does that mean? You have an idea? Um, yeah, kind of the same lines. Like okay. Kind of so this is why I had to put this in here, because this is really important. you got to understand the difference between a nutrient and your whole diet. So let's start with a nutrient and say, nutrients are substances for which, if you are deficient, you exhibit a deficiency syndrome, some illness. And that illness is reversed by giving you back that pure substance. Now, in the crudest sense, water is a nutrient. If you don't have water, Within 24, 48 hours, you start to get into trouble. But most people just kind of ignore that, okay? Now, you have to have some energy. Energy can come from carbohydrates, lipids, protein, and alcohol, okay? You need some protein in your diet. If you don't have it and you live in the middle of Sudan, what happens? and you're a baby that's six months old and you're not getting protein, what happens? Ultimately you do, but first you don't grow. You lose weight because you're excreting breakdown products of nitrogen all the time. If you do not have a certain amount of protein, you cannot grow. You need it to build everything. So you have a protein requirement that's based on amino acids you have essential fatty acids that you have to have. These are in small amounts. It's very hard for you to become deficient, but you can. This was discovered only in the 1960s and 70s when a child was shot by a gun and lost half of their intestine and was fed IV with sugar, water, and proteins and all the known vitamins and minerals but at the time, you could not get lipid, lipid because fats are greasy, into an IV fluid. And this child developed essential fatty acid deficiencies. Now, you could replace that actually by just putting it enough on the skin. You could absorb enough to, to replace that. But there are certain fatty acids you need in your diet or you develop a certain syndrome of... Uh, illness, skin problems particularly, and you have to have those essential fatty acids. Now, there are... The onset of these syndromes, they vary? Vary in time based on how deficient, how deficient that you would be. There are a number of minerals, meaning they're elemental things. We'll talk about that. And then there's vitamins, fat-soluble vitamins and water-soluble vitamins. So you kind of got to get a grip on this first. They understand that one of the reasons you eat is to get essential nutrients that you cannot live without, okay? And this will get into some public policy in a minute. Here are the amino acids on your handout. I'm not gonna quiz you on what they all are. Here are the minerals from your periodic table, which ones you need to have in your diet or you can have a deficiency syndrome. What would be one that's most important that you get a lot of every day? Oxygen? I wouldn't call that a dietary one. You breathe that. You're right. You need it. What's Sodium, you, we get way too much. Calcium is another, right? You need it for your bones, your teeth, things like that. Um, now, as opposed to nutrients, you got to understand diet is everything you eat. And your food isn't just made of nutrients. Your food carries things that like carcinogens, anti-carcinogens, toxins. 
compounds produced during storage and processing, mold, okay? Aflatoxins in stored grain in China used to cause millions of cases of liver cancer every year, okay? Compounds produced during cooking. Cooking changes your food. Some of the compounds made during cooking are not healthy, okay? Food additives that are there to preserve food so you don't get toxins from mold and fungus, but maybe those food additives also have biological effects, okay? In our country, thankfully, although lots of people want to blame food additives for every little thing that, that happens to them and their family, they're the most tested things in our, in our food and are probably not the cause of very many illnesses, okay? Phytochemicals. Our great food scientists over there are analyzing some of the foods now with these great high-performance liquid chromatographs. A black raspberry has 4,000 different compounds in it, okay? Only 20 or 30 of those are trace amounts of nutrients. A tomato may have 10,000 compounds in it. Do you see what I mean? Plants make a lot of chemicals in those foods that you eat every day. What do those do to your, to your health? Fiber is the material in food that you do not digest well. You're, you don't break it down. It forms the bulk of your poop, okay? And it serves as a substrate for all the microbes that live in your colon that metabolize that fiber in some way and they make chemicals that impact your health. We are in an era where we are learning so much about how the microbes that live in you and on you impact your health every day. There's as many bugs on you, believe it or not, as there are cells in your body. So, this is an interesting world we're beginning to understand. And how does that dynamic impact your health? Alcohol, infectious agents can be uh, carried in food as well. So diet, as you can see, is a very complicated morass. Nutrition or nutrients is very specifically related to those compounds you cannot live without, okay? And both of this gets into both of these get into uh, discussions of policy. Now, I showed you the biological hierarchy and the vertical organization and nutrition. Now, as we think about how food and nutrition impacts your health, there's also this kind of philosophical approach where we can give you a nutrient, a clinical trial of vitamin C to affect colds, okay? Very reasonable question. We can study nutrients like that. We can make pure chemicals out of tomatoes that aren't nutrients and test those. But we could also go and say, forget the vitamin C pill. We're just gonna do a study of orange juice. Okay, a food. You could do functional foods. We got a great food science and ag program here that make foods that are enriched in nutrients and other things that may impact health. You can study those. At a certain point, you can alter the food to the point where the compounds that are in there are in doses you would never find in nature, like a drug. Those would be called nutraceuticals, okay? Dietary patterns is what dietary guidelines is all about. More and more as we can statistically understand the diet, which is complex, we understand that dietary patterns are what determines most of your health outcomes. How do you orchestrate? Think of it like you're going to a concert and you're listening to a sonata with a single person playing a violin versus an orchestra, okay? Your diet is an orchestra and you have to get those pieces right. Now, here's the other thing you want to keep in mind as you look at public policy, the public health model versus the medical model. 
when I'm in the clinic with a patient every day, I am only worried about what do I need to do for that individual? What do they need? That recommendation for them may not be the same as a public health recommendation for all of Americans. You see what I mean? If I have a patient that had colon cancer and his terminal ileum was removed, okay, I have to give that person vitamin B12 shots because the terminal ileum of your colon or intestine is where you absorb it. So if you eat it, it just comes out the other end. I have to give them a shot to correct B12 deficiency. I'm not going to tell every American to get a B12 shot. You see what I mean? Public policy is for everyone. And that's why it's kind of interesting when people criticize dietary guidelines and recommendations for cholesterol or lipids and say, well, my father's cholesterol was 300 and he lived to be 90. Well, he's lucky. But for every one that lived to be 90 and didn't have a heart attack, there's 25 others who died prematurely because of their cholesterol at 300, okay? Same thing with smoking. Just because one guy lives to be 90 and gets shot by a jealous husband does not mean that Americans should not smoke. So, you really have to differentiate this. So many people confuse this when they're talking about these things. So, public health targets the whole population. Medical model provides personal recommendations for individuals. Okay. Causality. How do you prove causation? Now, take tobacco as a public health issue. That was easy. Okay? You either don't smoke, you smoke. It's obvious to everybody. You buy your cigarettes, it's easy for you to quantitate how much you smoke because you say, oh, it was a pack a day, or I smoke a pack every two days. You see, you could easily get, by asking questions, beautiful dose-response relationships. But if I asked any of you to tell me right now how much vitamin D do you get in your diet on average every day, what would you tell me? Does anybody know? You wouldn't know, because you can't measure it. You don't see it. So we have a lot of challenges in the assessment of what you eat in order to do these studies that correlate food and nutrition with a disease outcome and then act upon that in the realm of policy. Tobacco was easy, okay? Lung cancer, death, smoking, strong relationship, but nobody ever did what everybody would say is the definitive trial, and that is take half, take a group, divide them in half, make one half smoke and one not, and see what the outcome was. Why can't we do that? That's an easy one. What's the answer? Ethically. Ethically. You just can't do that. The evidence was just too strong. And we can't do studies to make people deficient in vitamin D to study what happens. It just can't be done. We have to resort to other kinds of epidemiology, other kinds of evidence. And I want to introduce you, if you've never seen this, to Bradford Hill's criteria of causation. You should just look it up on Wikipedia so you know of this man. He established the minimal conditions needed to determine a causal relationship between an exposure and a health outcome. They were presented by Bradford Hill, um, a statistician, along with Richard Pito in the 60s, to look at tobacco. But these criteria form the basis of epidemiologic research. And these principles are extremely important as we evaluate scientific data to make public policy. And in brief, they are just shown here. The strength of the association. How strong of a correlation is it? Is the risk of the outcome for a pack of cigarettes only increased twofold? Or is it 20-fold, okay? Things like that. 
consistency? Do you see the same results over many studies in different populations? Is it specific? Is it only non-filtered cigarettes or is it all cigarettes? Okay. Temporality, the exposure should precede the event, right? If you get lung cancer, then smoke. That doesn't show you anything, right? Temporality, there should be a biologic gradient or dose response. It should be plausible based on your scientific understanding. There should be coherence of the data between laboratory and humans. If you can mimic it in an experimental model or some other kind of analogy, uh, when it was smoking cigarettes to lung cancer, that analogy was not a big leap when it started to get to chewing tobacco and oral cancer. There was a similar experience, okay? So, these are the criteria that are used. You need to at least be aware of those. Now, should government be involved in regulating the American diet? So, what do you think? Is that something that should be, no, this is a, a, like guns, you have the right to bear arms, you, First Amendment, you have the right to say anything you want, uh, and you should be responsible for your food and nutritional health. And the government should stay out of it, it's a waste of money, taxpayers would be better off with that money in their own hands, what do you think? Yes, no, maybe? Great, great examples. That would be a great thing for all of you to kind of debate the sugar issue at the end of this. This is a big, big issue, the sodium issue. These are really, really interesting topics. So I think that was, that was very good. So our history that I want to just review is that there is a history on food safety and there is a history on deficiency diseases and I think you want to be aware of them. I'm only going to, I'm not going to delve into this any more than one slide on food safety. Um, if you've never read it, you should read this. I know nowadays they assign it to you in second grade before you're ready to understand it. Um, and. <laughs> Well, it's like my kid in second grade and they hauled him to the opera downtown. I mean, do you think after that he would ever go again? No. And so he's missing out on something important, but they ruined it by forcing it. This is a book you should read again. Um, but this is the kind of, this, this is what food supply was like just a hundred years ago. And this is scary. And thankfully, Theodore Roosevelt, who was an activist president, to say the least, said, this is going to stop. And I don't care how much money they want to put into my uh, bank account. I'm not being bought by industry. And we're going to make this healthier food supply. And that started a whole process that continues today of inspection of meat, etc. cetera. Um, but now, with... You know, the current, uh, just say, society and internet and being able to check on things quicker. Man, we pick up on things that in the old days you would never see. And I had this example when I gave a talk last fall in November. The CDC had a, a breakout that week of 838 salmonella cases in 38 states linked to imported cucumbers. You know, last year, Jenny's Ice Cream, our hometown favorite, had a big crisis. With listeria, I think. And, you know, I mean, here is a great ice cream, right? I mean, I think most of us really like this stuff and the creativity. But you know what? They basically had a processing plant and they were very kind of down home ish in their approach to things. And frankly, you know, the cows kind of walked in and gave the milk and it went right into the, the, the processing. The sanitation was awful. Okay, and it led to health issues and they closed down for a few months until they had to fix this. So um, we need uh, a very strong and continued effort on the part of the government to evaluate and maintain food safety in all aspects, 
the hard part right now is that they tend to have to react to problems instead of do enough inspections to prevent all of the outbreaks because they just don't have the funds and the resources, okay? Now, can we reduce the burden of deficiency syndromes by public health approaches targeting diet and nutrition? So let me ask you this. Have any of you ever seen someone with a nutrient deficiency syndrome? No, they don't Yeah, and what would be your observation of the person's health outcome that makes you think they're deficient? Uh huh. So that one, that is one that would not be proven for calcium yet. It's on the list, particularly associated with vitamin D also, because foods that have calcium often have vitamin D. So, but the point is, you didn't all jump up and down and say, wow, I have seen a lot of deficiency. Now, you might if you were in certain parts of the world that are suffering. Uh, enormously social and economic disparities, but most of you have not seen a deficiency. Yeah, go ahead. Right. Anemia from iron deficiency causes fatigue, tiredness, can relate to other things. I'll, I'll make a comment about that that would be an interesting thing for people to debate in a minute. So, let's just talk about deficiencies because you don't see a lot of these every day. Ricketts from vitamin D, pellagra from niacin deficiency, goiter, iodine deficiency, anemia from iron deficiency, neural tube defects in newborns due to deficiency in folate. Here's five examples that right now you see iron deficiency a little bit in women 25 to 40, menstruating heavily, had lots of kids, blood loss with birth, and not eating well, you can still see iron deficiency anemia. But it's way less prevalent and way less severe than it used to be. Now, why don't you see these things that 100 years ago, you walk down the street, you would see every single one of them. You wouldn't see the neural tube defects because these mostly died. But you would see every one of those if you walked down the streets of Columbus 100 years ago. Okay? If you were in the Nationwide Children's hospitals precursor 100 years ago, or even in the 1920s, the majority of every child admission to the hospital was due in one way or another to vitamin D deficiency. Okay? Why? Because rickets causes a deformity of the skeleton, not just the bowed legs, the chest, the ribs, the spine, it affects your breathing, puts you at risk of every virus that you'd get. You would get pneumonia, and many of those kids would die as a complication of that because your airway did not work properly due to vitamin D deficient impacts on your skeleton. Pellagra, niacin deficiency 100 years ago, was the main cause of people committing crimes, a main cause because it affected your mental health. A lot of criminals were having niacin deficiency. Pellagra, 100 years ago, was the main cause of an admission to what was then termed the insane asylum. Main cause of mental health problems, okay? 100 years ago, goiter was prevalent in the United States. My grandmother had and a large thyroid. I remember that. And my dad gave her shots of iodine, you know. Very interesting. Anemia, as we talked about, was extremely prevalent. I think that is why we never had a woman president in this country, because women during their most productive years of life were basically fatigued all the time because of anemia. Okay? And I think it's, you know, women's lib came around in the 1960s because for the 10, 20 years before that, we were putting iron in foods to correct iron deficiency anemia. So there's somebody's thesis someday is women's liberation and iron deficiency anemia. 
And neural tube defects are a rare problem of birth, birth defect was found to be related to folate. And every single one of these conditions you largely are not seeing because we changed health policy in this country for the better. What did we do? We discovered vitamin D through research in the 20s and by the 1930s, vitamin D was in dairy products, put there by law. Ricketts disappeared in one generation. It's astounding. Pellegra, niacin was put into all grains by law. Now, at the time, they took advantage of that. Our great marketers, vitamin donuts, but all grain products had niacin, pellagra disappeared, okay? Salt, iodine was put into salt, iodized salt. Goiters largely gone in this country. Iron, again, fortified whole grains. Folate in the 1990s added, those problems are disappearing as well government using good science to change the law by on food policy enormously impacting health huge you can't even it's it's amazing you don't even think of this stuff but this is happening every day every time you eat that something that our government did to regulate food is preventing you from getting sick so big time impact Okay, now let's take that to the next step. And when I served at the IOM on the dietary reference intake for vitamin D and calcium, what they do is when they think there's enough new science, you assign a committee to review the science to determine what should be the dietary reference intakes for a nutrient. So the vitamin D was the last one that was done and you need to understand this a little bit, but, you know, just kind of, I'm not going to quiz you too much. When you are on this committee, you are trying to define for the nation the estimated average requirement for Americans, knowing that people are diverse, different size, shape, ethnicity, genetics, etc. What's the average level that Americans should be consuming. What is the RDA? So that's the intake where the risk of a deficiency is only 2%. So that is the amount in your diet where 98% of Americans would be showing no deficiency. Then there is an upper level. This is a level where 98% of people with that amount of intake would show no toxicity. Because you don't want to take so much of something, you're toxic. Now, this is a real problem in the supplement industry and how they market things, okay? But there are levels beyond which you should not take because they're associated with illness. So when you do the DRI committees, you are defining these numbers for the nation, and in summary, this this was all of the outcomes that were looked at for vitamin D and calcium, bone health, cancer, frailty, cognitive disorders, immune-related disease, kidney stones, which is nephrolithiasis, hypertension, cardiovascular disease. All of these were proposed to be related to vitamin D or calcium. In the end, the data was only strong enough with regards to bone health to inform the committee with regards to the numbers uh, for consumption. All the rest need more science. And this is what you come up with at the end. What are the dietary reference intakes? And you see these, these are used all over the place uh, for every you know cereal box is gonna use the vitamin D uh, and calcium on there to tell you what percent of your requirement every day you're getting from your diet, etc. if you consume so many ounces of cereal with milk. Now, 
at the end of that process, the whole chapter at the end of this book that's yay big, talked about what was needed to improve the vitamin D and calcium recommendations. It largely focused on research, on vitamin D intake relative to all those other outcomes and the need for research on dose-response relationships. You need to know not just does 4,000 units versus nothing have an effect, you need to know what does 100, 400, 600, 2,000, 4, dose-response relationships. So what has happened since that book was published, all those recommendations made? Well, the NIH actually stopped funding vitamin D research because they said, okay, DRIs are out, we can ignore this for now. Instead of reading the last chapter saying, need more research for all these other outcomes. I, I, I can't tell you for sure because I haven't looked into the ones on vitamin E and well, probably the vitamin E and the antioxidants was the one prior to vitamin D. Um, and so right now, they haven't, they're not doing these very often unless there's really substantial amount of data. Uh, but it was very interesting to me. At the end of this chapter, there are like 10 great things that need to be studied in greater depth. And then they basically stop funding it. Not important because the DRIs just came out. Duh. Anyway, <laughs> very interesting. So, so when you come up with the, the data, it is then up to all the organizations to use it. So by law, it is used on all the labeling that relates to, so you see it every day on the foods that you eat, for sure, as how it's used. And because the only outcome that was strongly associated with vitamin D was bone health, those situations where bone health is of issue, say nursing homes, where old people are prone to osteoporosis, falls, bone issues, um, <coughs> government oversight of foods that need to be available to seniors are probably impacted by this. Child lunches programs have to have the right amount of vitamin D and calcium in them in schools. So there are policy downstream that use these um, in those ways. Now, talked about that. Now, diet, nutrition, global health policy. I'm going to give you an example because I just, th this one just warms your heart because it came out of not some government idea. It actually came out of philanthropy. And I just want to give you a little example of the, the World Cancer Research Fund and the American Institute for Cancer Research. People who were affluent and wanted to have an impact through philanthropy got together and said, we're going to start something um, stimulated by a government panel he headed by George McGovern. That's a good question to ask in a minute. <coughs> so think about who he was. <coughs> but they got together and said, we are going to come up with summarizing the truth about food, nutrition, and cancer. <coughs> and they established the World Cancer Research Fund the American arm of that is the American Institute for Cancer Research, or AICR. And this started about late 1970s and has grown enormously. Um, and through their ups and downs of getting funds, uh, continue to do remarkable work. A little bit about some of the things that they have done. The most important being Instead of you getting your information from the newspaper where the headlines will say pizza ca uh, prevents cancer or, you know, these crazy things that you see all the time, they 
made it a focus to fund research, particularly young scientists, but also do systematic reviews of the literature and make reports that are truly based on science. There are two big reports, 1997, 2007. You can download these whole things and just get a look at it. And they have a great additional document you can find on the website on public policy about how they are trying to translate their science into public policy around the world. And they are doing a remarkable job at this. Now, after 2007, um, these big reports took years to come, come together with hundreds of people contributing. Then they're 10 years old. They decided instead of every 10 or 15 years coming out with a new big report, they were going to put smaller ones out three or four a year. And that would keep this process, this assembly line, continually working instead of starting over and, and, and whatnot. So we'll move into what that is in a minute. Now, how do they categorize something like what is the effect of tomatoes on prostate cancer? Well, they look at all the evidence and then they put it in one of these categories. The data is very weak, unlikely, limited, no conclusion, limited, suggestive, probable, but not strong enough, convincing basis for a recommendation. So any number of hundreds of nutrition and food and diet variables have been assessed and categorized. These are what these tables would look like. So here is the one on <coughs> the relationship of body fat and risk of cancer. Convincing for cancer of the esophagus, pancreas, colon, rectum, breast, postmenopausal, endometrium, and kidney. Convincing. You can add more to that list now. This is from 2007. Probable gallbladder, pancreas, breast, postmenopausal, endometrium, breast, uh, postmenopausal, weight gain, etc. Limited for liver and lung. So they take every variable and put them into these tables so that they make sense, they're understandable, easily translatable. And in the end, they take all of this recommendation and come up with these 10 guidelines that they think should be utilized by governments around the world for public health recommendations, okay? To govern food policy. So you can see them here. <coughs> relates to weight, physical activity, foods and drinks that promote weight gain, so that's sugar, sweetened beverages, plant foods, eat mostly foods of plant origin, limit intake of red meat, et cetera, et cetera. Um, these are the ones that if everybody would do these in every country, the cancer burden would clearly be reduced, who knows, 30%. These sound very simple, but if you did that as a government policy and stimulated this kind of a change, the burden of the cancer would go way down. And because those same recommendations are similar for cardiovascular disease, stroke, diabetes, the whole chronic disease picture of a nation would change, okay? Now, what they've done instead of these every 10-year big reports is the continuous update program, and we meet every summer in London to sit down and go through just enormous amounts of data to come up with these reports. And it's fun because London is always fun, but uh, it's stimulating. You're around great people, the brightest people in the world on this topic. The discussions are great, the debates, the arguments. It's the most fun thing I do every year, other than coming over here and teach with you. Anyway, continuous update program. Here are the updates that they have done over recent years. And go take a look at some of these. Uh, very, very interesting. I'll just talk a little bit about the endometrial cancer one that came out a year or so ago. Um, excess body fat is one of the strongest factors that increases the risk for this cancer. High glycemic load diet like donuts, 
sugar sweetened beverages, etc. Physical activity reduces the risk, and the great thing, coffee seemed to have some benefit here. So if you're a coffee drinker, this is one of the potential benefits is endometrial cancer. Let me just show you how profoundly strong this data is. This is just blows your mind. So these are just four different ways of presenting epidemiologic studies. Probably this up here is the, the simplest to do. As you look at body mass index from about 22 on up to 40, you see a curve that goes up very strongly. The y-axis is called relative risk. What is the risk that you will get this cancer? And it's on a log scale. So if you look from 22 up to 35, you've increased your risk fivefold. If you're up to 40, you've increased your risk of this cancer tenfold. I mean, this is big time risk. This is, this is almost in the ballpark of tobacco uh, for many tobacco-related malignancies. This is a very, very strong and powerful relationship. And from this work, they estimate that 59% of U.S. endometrial cancer cases, or about three in five, could be prevented by being at a healthy weight and being physically active. 29,000 cases each year. Astounding. Okay? They take this to the next level all of their work to have global impact, working with governments all over the world. And just this spring, um, are having a formal relationship with the World Health Organization to help implement policies in countries around the world that are more in line with these guidelines for cancer prevention. So, so far, more than 260 implemented government policy actions across 100 different countries uh, through these efforts. So this is, this is an impressive effort that came out of a philanthropic organization um, that's having real impact. So again, I think it's a good example of science moving forward and having impacts.